Okay, so um, see it's 201, let's go ahead and get started and people can continue to, um, to trickle in. Um, so good afternoon, everybody, welcome. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Megan Moore and I'm a board member with Friends of the Long Pond Greenbelt. Celebrating its 25th anniversary in 2022, Friends of the Long Pond Greenbelt is an all-volunteer organization that works to advance the preservation, stewardship, appreciation, and enjoyment of the Long Pond Greenbelt, that unique expanse of coastal plain ponds, freshwater swamps, wetlands and woodlands encompassing more than 800 protected acres. The Long Pond Greenbelt stretches six miles between the villages of Sag Harbor and Sagaponic in the town of Southampton. You can visit longpondgreenbelt.org to learn more about membership and sign up for our newsletter. Uh, we are trying to reach 425 members this year for our 25th year, and I believe there's a little way to go. Um, so if you're able to help us meet that goal, that would be great. And I believe if you sign up now, between now and the end of the year, you actually get membership for 2023 as well. Um, and you can see on our website too, just a couple of important uh, housekeeping matters. We have been voicing and leading opposition to the PSEG LIPA proposal to conduct drilling through the green belt. So you can learn more about that proposal as well as what you can do to also voice opposition to that. And then also don't forget on Tuesday, um, election day, you can turn over your ballot and vote yes to proposal one, uh, which is the Clean Water, Clean Air and Green Jobs Environmental Bond Act of 2022, which would authorize up to $4.2 billion in, in state bonds to fund environmental protection, natural restoration, resiliency, and clean energy projects. So um, now that I have that housekeeping out of the way, um, Friends of the Long Pond Greenbelt is super excited today to co-host co um, today's final Sundays at Two lecture of 2022 with the Hamptons Observatory. And um, just wanted to introduce our um, speaker, but also Hamptons Observatory um, is also a nonprofit that relies on public support, has served the community since 2005. Its mission is to foster interest in science, particularly astronomy through educational programs. Lectures, star parties, portable planetarium shows, and other events are held, often in collaboration with other nonprofit organizations. Hamptons Observatory has established the first astronomical observatory on the South Fork in East Hampton, complete with Long Island's largest research grade telescope. These facilities will soon be accessible over the internet to students, teachers, researchers, and the general public. Uh, Hamptons Observatory offers all of its programs free of charge so that everyone can learn about and enjoy the universe around them. And we're pleased uh, to have Hamptons Observatory senior lecturer, William Taylor with us today to present highlights of the fall sky. Mr. Taylor has been a NASA JPL solar system ambassador since 2014, lecturing about the universe around us and sharing his love of the heavens by giving guided tours of the sky through telescopes. He is a lifelong East End resident. And so with that, I'll turn it over to you, William. Thank you so much for that introduction. It's, it's really exciting for me to work uh, with, the, with the Long Pond Green Belt. Uh, it's one of my favorite places to, to explore out here on the East End of Long Island. It's, it's a really beautiful uh, set of hiking trails, among other things, uh, for those who, uh, who don't know. Um, and it's especially beautiful this time of year. Um, so. The theme of my talk, uh, my theme of my talk right now is about. Um, oh, hi. Hi. Just inviting everyone who hasn't um, to uh, mute your microphone, maybe for the time being. Um, yeah, you can't deal with that right, so we'll find them. Huh? Okay, thanks. So yeah, so anyway, so my talk this evening is about um, is about the fall sky, and it's about uh, the, the different objects you can see, and in particular, there's going to be a couple of events coming up. Uh, that'll be really special. There's a lunar eclipse in a few days. Um, and also in a few weeks, we have what's called the opposition of Mars when Mars becomes as close to Earth as it usually gets every couple of every two years or so. Um, so yeah, let me let me just start sharing um, some screens uh, I prepared. Um, okay. So um, I'm a little bit uh, <laughs> I'm a little bit tired today because I woke up pretty early for an, a special event that happened that was supposed to happen this morning. Um, it, it didn't quite happen. Um, and that was uh, a rocket launch uh, that happens every, every couple of months or so. Uh, they launch a rocket from a place in Virginia called Wallops um, uh, Air Force Base, I think. 
Um, and this rock in particular was called the SS Sally Ride, and it's scheduled to uh, visit the International Space Station um, in a couple of um, uh, in a couple of uh, well, it's supposed to be it was supposed to launch this morning, but there was a fire alarm at the last minute, so it was, it was scrubbed. So tomorrow, there's another chance uh, for everyone to see it if you would like to try. Um, I don't have the information right in front of me, but this it's supposed to be launched around 5.50 in the morning tomorrow. That's 5.50. Um, so pretty early. Um, although thanks to daylight savings time being over, it's not quite as early as it would have been a few days ago. So um, it's also a, um, an interesting opportunity if you live anywhere near the beach and Long Island, for instance, you can go down to the ocean um, and you can watch. And uh, if you um, are lucky and the weather is clear, you can see a rocket coming up over the horizon. It's very interesting. I, I've done this a couple of times. Um, the secret is to bring a phone with you that has a good internet connection. So you can listen to the live broadcast from NASA uh, because uh, very often or every so often things get delayed or uh, scrubbed altogether. Um, so if, if you don't, um, if you don't have the live broadcast, with you, you might miss something like that. You might miss a delay and you might think nothing is happening. But um, once it does go off, you usually see it a few seconds after it's launched from the launch pad in Virginia. Um, and it's really interesting. It, it goes, this one in particular is going to go up into the International Space Station and it's bringing some supplies for the astronauts there. Um, so uh, things like that aren't always super predictable. They depend on, on human choices. But um, the, uh, most of the things I'm going to be talking about today are more predictable. They are uh, things in the sky that we can see pretty clearly. Um, I'm going to go ahead and change the date that we're looking at. I hope you all can see this. This is a picture of what the sky looks like now. Um, the sun in the sky overhead, of course. Um, I'm going to flip a little bit forward in time to this evening. And there's I'm a square gonna... covering the uh, the top right of your presentation. Okay, now it's can... like a black screen. I think it's basically the Zoom. Yeah, thing. those are the other Zoom participants. You might see your own box or you might see other people's. There's a way to minimize it if you like. Um, but thank you for making me aware of that. I, I can see that too. But can can you all hopefully see the, the majority of the screen and, and the stars on it? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. So this is a planetarium program called Stellarium. Um, and it just gives us a general view of what the night sky looks like. Here, I have programmed it to give uh, us a view of around seven o'clock this evening. So I'm just gonna go over the main things that you can see in the night sky. Um, right now, the most prominent thing is the moon, of course, the moon is getting close to being full. Um, so it looks pretty small in this illustration, but the moon uh, is pretty spectacular right now. Um, it's, it's pretty close to fall um, and it will be fall on Tuesday morning and um so but right now yeah, besides the moon the most prominent thing you might see in the night sky is when you look towards the south you can see a very bright star that's actually the planet jupiter so um it's been really dazzling for the last couple of days and weeks jupiter is definitely among the most uh, fascinating objects you can see through a telescope it's also uh, through the naked eye that one of the brightest planets and right now it's the only it's the brightest planet you can see. The planet Venus is, is out of the picture for the time being because it's too close to the sun. So if you look towards the south in the evening sky and, and you have a telescope handy, you might zoom in on Jupiter and here's what you might be presented with. So uh, this is a, a, a pretty clear view of what you might see through a small telescope of the planet Jupiter and its four moons. So they're labeled here for you, Callisto, Ganymede, Io, and Europa. Uh, all four of these moons are about the same size or much bigger than our moon, um, and they orbit around Jupiter very quickly. So if you're looking through a telescope, you might see them shift over the course of just a few minutes or at most a couple hours. Um, every night they're in a different position. Um, if you are lucky and you have a really good clear sky, you can see a lot more detail in Jupiter, even with a, a small telescope. So for instance, my telescope has a mirror about six inches across. Um, some other ones you might come across have like eight to 10 inches, um, or even like a smaller telescope with just four inches across. You can see a lot of details such as these clouds. Um, you, you can't always see in as much detail as you're seeing now, but you can definitely make out the, um, the broad horizontal stripes on Jupiter, which mark its lines of latitude. So Jupiter has weather just like Earth does. 
although it's weather is much more extreme and more visible for, from our point of view, there's no ground per se on Jupiter, it's just atmosphere all the way down. Um, and the most notable thing you can see in this picture is the great red spot of Jupiter. Um, it's a huge hurricane about the size of Earth. Um, so that gives you a sense of how big Jupiter is. It's about 10 times the size of our planet. Um, and this hurricane has been going on Jupiter for a couple hundred years at least. Um, so uh, most of our pictures from Jupiter um, come from space probes that I've visited there. There's one called Juno right now, which is taking great, very high detailed images of Jupiter. Um, but there's a lot you can see even with a small telescope. It's considered, um, I've heard people refer to Jupiter as the amateur's planet, which is just a nice way of saying that uh, even someone with a small amateur telescope can see a lot of detail on this planet just because it's so large um, and it's very impressive. Um, so let's zoom out from Jupiter and let's use it as a guide to find some of the other planets in the night sky. So to the right of Jupiter, um, there is kind of a dark part of the sky in, in most of our evenings, um, but there is one or two bright stars that might grab your attention. Um, this one to the right of Jupiter is called Saturn. Um, it's a planet, of course, um, and it is part of the, it's right now taking up a little spot in the constellation Capricorn. So I haven't highlighted the constellations before, but I'm gonna turn those on now. Capricornus is supposed to be a sea goat. Um, to me, it looks something like a boat. Some people see it as a smile. Um, on the whole, it's, it's pretty faint compared to the planet Saturn which is its most famous current occupant. Um, Saturn is beautiful. Um, and even with a small telescope, if we zoom in on it, we can see in a tremendous amount of detail. Um, so uh, apart from the labels, <laughs> which aren't there when you look at the telescope, uh, this is a pretty accurate view of what you might see through Saturn with a six inch or eight inch telescope. Um, you can clearly see the rings of Saturn um, and you can see it's many moons. The brightest one, usually is Titan here on the right side. And Titan is the largest moon of Saturn. And it is um, the most interesting moon in the solar system, in my opinion, because it's the only one with a very thick atmosphere. I'm going to zoom in to a degree that you couldn't possibly do with a small telescope, um, but it's a little disappointing because Titan is so covered in thick, thick uh, shrouds of gas that even when the Voyager space probe went by Titan in the 1970s and 80s, it couldn't see much detail. Saturn, on the other hand, is very, very uh, beautiful with the small telescope. There's a lot of detail to see, and the more powerful your telescope is, the more you'll see. Um, but the most beautiful thing, of course, are the rings of Saturn, um, which um, are composed of hundreds of millions. I, I, don't, I don't want to guess a number, probably a lot more than that. Little pieces of rocks and ice that orbit Saturn. Um, and you can also make out some of the small moons of Saturn that um, are a little bit smaller than our moon for the most part, except for Titan, which is much bigger. So those two planets, Saturn and Jupiter, are the main planets that we see in the early evening. There are two other planets, um, and then we'll get to Mars in a little bit, that are uh, two other gas giants, um, Uranus and Neptune, um, which are very difficult to see through uh, the naked eye. Um, Neptune being impossible to see with the naked eye, Uranus being um, possible, um, and I'll tell you a good night this, this month where you can't see with the naked eye. Through a uh, telescope, Uranus is, oops, see, it's, it's difficult to distinguish Uranus from the stars. It looks just like a star through a pair of binoculars. Through a telescope, um, with a powerful telescope, you might be able to see it as a disk. Um, and that was how Uranus was discovered. Um, all the other planets in the solar system, um, well, the most famous planets, Mercury, Venus, uh, not counting Earth, because uh, we live on it, but Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn were known to people all through human history because they're clearly visible in the night sky. And what makes them very interesting, significant is that they move across the constellations instead of staying fixed in patterns. Uranus was not observed by anyone in ancient history, as far as we know. Um, and it wasn't until 1786, I believe, that a uh, a gentleman living in Bath, England, named William Herschel, discovered it uh, through his telescope. Um, he was a, a wonderful musician, classical musician, um, and in his spare time, he did astronomy. 
um, in his, through a small telescope in his backyard. Um, discovering a new planet for the first one in human history to discover a new planet made him incredibly famous. And he became a professional astronomer along with his sister Caroline. And the two of them discovered huge numbers of new galaxies, nebulae, and everything like that in the 18th century. Um, Uranus eventually led to a new discovery of another planet because uh, the, the movements of Uranus to the solar system were a little bit irregular. And because of this irregularity, um, well, I'll, I'll try to explain um, briefly. Um, Uranus's orbit could um, easily be predicted uh, by Newton's law of gravity, which was discovered a few decades earlier. Um, and um, it should have followed a certain pattern based on the gravitational attraction of the sun, based on the gravitational influence of the other planets that were known, such as Jupiter and Saturn. But Uranus started moving in a sort of wayward path. And in the 19th century, even though this was a very uh, subtle deviation from its predicted path, scientists were very curious about what was going on. And they had such confidence in Newton's law of gravity that they, uh, they strongly suspected it couldn't be the fault of that. Um, so this led two astronomers, one an Englishman named Adams and one a Frenchman named Le Verrier, to calculate that there should be another planet out there, which was slowly tugging and pulling on Uranus is by the force of gravity. Um, and they were even able to predict through very detailed and complicated calculations where that planet should be. Um, it was finally uh, a German astronomer who got word of this theory and pointed the telescope in the right place. And that was how the planet Neptune was discovered. So Neptune is a very, very faint planet. It's um, a very large planet, it's much larger than the Earth, but because it's so far from Earth, it's really on the outskirts of the solar system. It's 30 times farther from the sun than we are. And it is difficult to see without a pair of binoculars. Um, even with binoculars, it looks just like a star. But if you have a very powerful telescope, you might be able to see a disk, a very small disk. Um, and that is the face of Neptune. Here you see it with its bright moon Triton, which is again um, uh, on the same order of size or larger than our moon um, and a very interesting world in its own right. I will try to zoom in on Triton, even though this is not anything you could see with a telescope from Earth, uh, but it is a, a very interesting little world. It's covered in active volcanoes of ice, um, probably because of the gravitational uh, force of Neptune acting on it. So this is marks the outermost parts of the known solar system in terms of the large planets. There are probably um, many dozens of little small planets like Pluto beyond that. And there might even be more planets, even large planets that we don't know about yet. Scientists continue to look for that. But so that means that even in the early evening, if you know where to look, you can see uh, four of the biggest planets of, in the solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Um, and if you are patient and you wait a little bit later in the evening, you can see Mars. Here is Mars just beginning to rise over the horizon. I'm going to um, uh, fast forward in time a little bit so we can see it better. So Mars rises up. Um, currently, it's in the constellation Taurus, which is the bull. Um, now, let me actually let me rewind and a little bit and take us back to a time when we can see all planets in the row, um, and including the moon. All four of these planets in the moon um, are, um, let me get this up for you. Yeah, they're all in a straight line that's called the ecliptic. It's in red here on the map. This marks the plane of the solar system. Um, and it's very interesting to see how the planets line up like this. Um, the, the reason they do is because the solar system, which is incredibly wide, um, incredibly huge beyond our comprehension really, is still very, very flat. So we are seeing it sort of like the surface of a record that we are standing on. Um, so the planets are always in, um, they seem to be in a straight line with each other. They never deviate very far from this red line. So they do wander across it longitudinally throughout the year. Um, they usually move um, towards the east, um, which is to say they move to the left from our point of view. But a planet like Mars will, for a few months, start moving backwards. It'll move towards the right. Um, as we go through the course of the evenings. Let me show you what that looks like if I can. 
Um, so I'm going to just change the date a little bit. And we can see that the, sorry, uh, the moon moves very quickly, um, but the planets move a little bit more slowly across the constellation. Here we can see Mars doing its rightwards journey in through Taurus. That's called its retrograde motion. Um, I might as well, while I'm here, go to a very special date that's coming up. And that is um, the 7th of December, when, the Mars, when Mars and the moon will meet each other very, very close in the night sky. And this is also uh, by an interesting coincidence, the night that Mars comes closest to Earth. Um, so uh, let me bring <laughs> the moon and Mars even closer because they will become exceedingly close over the course of the evening. Um, and if I center on Mars, I should be able to keep track of what's happening. So um, I will try to speed up time a little bit. And now you can see the moon moving towards Mars. Um, it's just going to just barely avoid colliding with Mars from our point of view. Um, now, uh, that's, this is the point of view from Long Island. Um, you won't see the moon pass directly in front of Mars, but if you happen to live a little bit farther north, for instance, New Hampshire, or a little bit farther west, so for instance, in Chicago, or uh, many other parts of the United States, you can actually watch the moon pass right in front of Mars, which is a really interesting event that happens very rarely. Um, and I, I find it so interesting to compare how uh, big the moon seems uh, from our point of view with how small Mars seems. You can see this is an, an actual size comparison of what they look like through a telescope. Mars looks incredibly small, uh, but as we know in reality, Mars is quite a lot bigger than the moon. It's about twice the diameter. Um, so. Um, this is just hopefully gives you a sense of how deep space is. The moon, the Mars only looks so small because it's hundreds of times farther away from us than the moon is, um, which is why it is, for among other things, much harder to travel to Mars than it is to travel to the moon. Um, if you have a very powerful telescope, um, you can see details on Mars. Um, that makes it one of the most interesting planets to view. Um, a lot of the details, um, and I hope this will stay centered as I move through the evening. Um, let's see if I can change the time. Yeah, um, we can watch Mars rotate through the night. It's very interesting to watch. It, it rotates at exactly the same rate that the Earth does once every 24 hours. And so we see uh, a lot of detailed change over the course of Mar Mars's face if we watch through the night. Um, here, it just happens to have landed on a very bright dark spot called Sirtis Major. Um, which through a telescope looks like a, a great dark continent against um, an orange sea. Through, uh, through a telescope, Mars is uh, very red looking, but the most interesting thing visually to look for are the dark deserts, as opposed to the red deserts. There are two types of deserts. Um, with great difficulty, you can see the ice caps of Mars. Yeah, usually they're turned towards us when it comes close to us, but right now they're turned almost away, so we don't see them very easily. Um, now. This is uh, an exaggerated view of how good you can see Mars. Um, I don't want to deceive you. When you look through a normal telescope, mm, this is a more accurate <laughs> representation of what you might see, a very small dot with some indistinct red and black spatches on it. But Mars is a planet that really rewards um, patience and it rewards uh, very high magnification. So uh, it takes a lot of practice to see Mars well. and um, for me personally, it was uh, very disappointing for the first couple of years I was uh, trying to look through it with the telescope. I couldn't really see very much. Um, and that was because it is, uh, it is so small that you really need a lot of magnification more than I was used to looking with um, to, to see any of these details at all. Um, but um, now is a great time to start practicing on Mars because December uh, 7th is when it's going to come closest to Earth. And that will be the closest it comes for about two years. Um, for most of the time, Mars is very far away from the Earth. And we can't see anything like these kinds of details. The best uh, uh, kinds of uh, advice I can give are to uh, use a lot of patience because uh, most of the time the atmosphere is very blurry on Earth. Um, but if we are patient every couple of minutes uh, or if you, every more frequent than that, even sometimes, the sky will clear pause for a moment and we can see with incredible clarity uh, what is really um, happening on Mars. There are two moons of Mars just labeled here Phobos and Deimos. 
Um, unless you have a, a very powerful telescope, you, you can't see them. Um, but um, so if you don't have a telescope at all, though, just keep an eye on this one date, December 7th. Um, this is um, in the, I believe, uh, early morning or mid after midnight. Um, so um, yeah, so actually early morning on December 8th, around midnight, between December 7th and December 8th, that's when you'll see the moon come exceedingly close to Mars. Um, and if you're lucky, you might even see the moon pass over and cover Mars. That's an interesting astronomical event to look forward to. But there is one that's happening much sooner. So I'm going to return to our own time, November 6th, and pass forward a couple of days. So here we are on the morning of November 8th. So that's Tuesday. I remember the morning because this is an early morning event. We have, um, um, let's see here. I actually need to go to the day before. Yeah, so no, the early morning of November 8th, we can see the moon in a total eclipse. So um, let's try to, um, let's try to advance the time a little bit. Here you see the eclipse starting to begin. Um, this is around, I, I think, I believe 416 is the time I heard of when the eclipse will begin. Um, and it will last for a while. It's not, it's not a quick thing, like a solar eclipse. This is the moon passing into Earth's shadow. So um, I'll have the exact dates for you on another slide. But this happens every, every so often. There was an, a lunar eclipse that was visible in the springtime, which some of you might have seen. Um, it's a really spectacular thing when it happens because the moon becomes very dark and it becomes very red. And I'll talk about that. Here's an old painting of one. Um, it's an eerie sight, I think, um, but it's very beautiful. Um, here's an old illustration of, of what happens, basically. Uh, the moon passes behind Earth's shadow. Um, now, this is not to scale, of course, um, but um, it's almost impossible to draw this to scale accurately because the moon uh, and Earth are separated by a considerable distance. Um, this is a more accurate to scale drawing of what it's like the, the shadow of the earth and the shadow of the moon are sort of like two very long extended tubes or cones in space. Um, and most of the time, the two objects don't pass through each other. Um, and that is a little bit hard to see with a two dimensional picture, but the reason is because there are three dimensions. And most of the time the earth passes above or below the moon shadow and vice versa, the moon passes above and below the earth's shadow. Um, but very, uh, every couple of months, they happen to line up exactly and the moon will pass the earth's shadow or the earth will pass through the moon's tiny shadow. And when that happens, we get an eclipse. Uh, a solar eclipse is when the moon was when the earth passes through the moon shadow and we blocks out our view of the sun. Um, these are uh, not particularly rare, but because the moon shadow is so small when it hits the earth, it's only visible from a small portion of the earth's surface. So there won't be a one visible in the United States until 2024, which is not so long from now, um, in April. Uh, definitely something to watch out for. Um, in the meantime, this total eclipse of the moon will be visible from the United States and from many other countries um, on the morning of November 8th. So um, as you can see, the Eastern United States is only gonna be able to see part of it, but we'll be able to see almost the entire total eclipse um, and there will also be the interesting thing of watching the moon set while it is eclipsed and very faint and small. So if you want to enjoy the spectacle, you will have to get up early. Um, these um, are sometimes calculated for when the total eclipse might happen. The, the, total, the moon will be totally dark starting at 516 in the morning, Eastern time. Um, and it will continue to be dark um, until sunrise, until the moon sets as well. Um, um, which will happen a couple, uh, looks like uh, 30 minutes later. Um, so uh, if you want, you could get up at uh, 516 and see the moon totally dark, or you could get up a little bit earlier before that. Um, so for instance, it looks like um, 409 might be the correct time to watch the beginning of the moon, uh, the moon's total eclipse. Now the times here are in universal time, so Greenwich Mean Time, to convert them all to Eastern time, just subtract five hours. So uh, the total eclipse, um, the partial eclipse begins at 5.09 in the morning on November 8th um, and will become total by 
516, sorry, it becomes at 409 in the morning, it'll become total at 516. Um, now the moon turns really dark red during eclipse and that's a little bit strange. It doesn't become totally black or disappear. The reason is because there is still a source of light available to the moon and that's the earth's atmosphere. So the light that streams through our atmosphere gets scattered depending on what color it is. And the light that is uh, preferentially blue gets scattered the most. Um, and that is among other things why the sky is blue. Um, and it's also why evenings are red because um, the sunlight has to pass through more atmosphere to reach the twilight zone of the earth. Um, and that light that's left over is mostly red and orange. Now, the light that passes through the Earth's atmosphere now into space again is almost completely red and orange. Um, and so people standing on the moon would see a view like this. You see the Earth, uh, Earth's <laughs> wouldn't appear just like a big um, black shadow. It's a, it's a ring, a, a very <laughs> sinister looking ring, I believe, um, that passes from where the sun used to be. Um, and um, someone standing on the moon for instance, on this eclipse, would see Venus right next to it um, and this ominous looking ring. The ring makes the entire surface of the moon dark red for that reason. So, uh, so far, no one, uh, to my knowledge, has seen um, uh, uh, a total eclipse while on the moon, but maybe in a few years that will be the case. So, um, just to cap highlight a couple other things that you can see during the night sky, I've highlighted um, the constellations that are visible this time of year. Um, and I'm going to reset the time to this evening so you can just get a sense of what it'll be like when you go out tonight. Um, so again, this is around seven o'clock. Uh, the most interesting um, constellations aren't necessarily where the planets Jupiter and Saturn are. That's a pretty faint part of the sky um, with three faint constellations, Pisces, Aquarius, and Capricorn. Between Jupiter and Saturn to below them is a star called Fomalhaut or from out. Um, that's part of a constellation called the Southern Fish, which I hope you, you can see here as a stick figure. Um, the rest of the constellation is very faint, but Fomalhaut is a, a very bright star and particularly close to Earth. So um, it just happens to be all alone in the sky in that direction. Um, if we, for instance, look where Jupiter is and look above it, it's a much more um, bright constellation called Pegasus, um, which is a classic ball constellation. It represents the horse, the winged horse of Greek mythology. Um, and to see it as a horse, just remember that it's half a horse and it's upside down. So this is the nose of the horse. It's a star called Ennis. Um, and this is the neck of the horse and here is hooves. So it's a sort of a bust of a horse upside down in the sky uh, as if it's a flying horse. And it's actually a pretty compelling uh, constellation. It looks, looks a lot like what it's supposed to, I believe, um, as long as you give it that little freedom. Um, and Pegasus is mostly marked by um, four bright stars that make the great square of Pegasus. Um, and it's easily found right now this year because Jupiter is very close to it. So just always look right above Jupiter and you'll see the four, the great square of Pegasus. If you continue on in this direction, so if you, for instance, follow the two stars on the left of Pegasus, which are called Algeni and Alpharats, and continue them on in a straight line, you'll come to a star called Calf, which is part of the constellation Cassiopeia, which again is another one of the classic constellations of the fall and of the winter. Um, and this is a northern constellation. It always is visible all throughout the year because it's close to the pole of the sky. Um, to many of us, it looks like a W. To other times, it looks like a three, or it looks like the Greek letter Sigma, depending on what direction we're looking at it from. Um, and it represents the the queen Cassiopeia, who was queen of Ethiopia and the mother of Andromeda um, and the husband, the wife of Cepheus. Um, all three of those figures are right here. The legend of Andromeda was that um, she was put, uh, she was the princess, but she was put forth as a human sacrifice in order to protect the kingdom of Cepheus and Cassiopeia. And if she had not been rescued in the nick of time by Perseus, who's right here, um, she would have been devoured by a sea monster called Cetus the whale, who's also over here in the night sky, a little bit further south. So all these constellations are in the same part of the sky. They make up a whole story. Um, and um, for us, it's um, 
if you're new to astronomy, um, it's worthwhile to try to recognize the constellation Cassiopeia, uh, which is uh, pretty easy to make out because it looks like the letter W most of the time. Um, if you cannot see a queen in the simple shape of Cassiopeia, think of it possibly as a queen's throne. Um, and part of the legend in Greek mythology is that as a punishment for, for uh, vanity and cruelty and so forth, she was attached to this throne, which uh, rotates to the night sky, which is, a, I'm sure, an uncomfortable experience. Um, and close to Cassiopeia, uh, if you have a little bit more background in astronomy and you want to try a new constellation, maybe, Perseus is a great one to look out for uh, because Perseus is a um, kind of a stick figure representation of a hero um, with one very interesting star called Algol um, and one of the legs of Perseus. And what makes it so interesting is that every couple of days it dims dramatically and it goes through an eclipse, just like our, our moon will in a few days. Um, what's actually happening is that there are two stars at Algol, a bright star and a dim star that orbit each other. Um, and sometimes the dim star will pass in front of the bright star and um, leave us with, with a much diminished light. And you can actually see these eclipses when they happen. They, they're pretty dramatic. This bright star um, here, which you can see is brighter than most of the other stars in the constellation, becomes quite dim around the same magnitude as this star I've highlighted here in the foot of Perseus. Um, and if you're interested, you can look up the dates for when that happens. Um, one other great fall constellation to look out for, not really a constellation, it's a cluster of stars called the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. And here I've zoomed in on them um, much more than you can see with the naked eye, but you can uh, uh, see them pretty well with a, um, with a pair of binoculars. There's quite a lot of stars there and they are a open cluster, uh, which means that they are a group of stars that have formed together and have not drifted apart yet. Um, our star, the sun, is a kind of a loner star. Um, it's by itself mostly. Um, it doesn't have a close companion star except for the planets. But the Pleiades, um, like many other stars in the, the galaxy, are, are forming a group, a community that huddle pretty close together like that. Um, so I think I've gone through most of the, um, the bright and familiar stars of the autumn sky. But I will again zoom forward a little bit through a couple of hours so you can see the most famous of the winter stars, um, the planet, the constellation Orion, which will rise after 10 o'clock or so in, the, in November. And as we go through the winter, it will rise earlier and earlier. Um, it's the most beautiful of all constellations, in my opinion. Um, it's extremely bright um, and it's very well marked out the figure of a hunter with his enormous club and his shield. Um, and if you follow the three bright stars of Orion's belt, many people recognize them. Towards the left, they lead you to the brightest star of the night sky called Sirius, which um, this evening will rise around 11 o'clock. But again, as the winter goes on, it will rise earlier and earlier, and it's the clearest and brightest of the uh, winter stars. So um, those are the main constellations you can see this evening. I promised I would talk a little bit about some new images that also have just come through from the James Webb te uh, Telescope. Um, so the, the main constellations, uh, the main images um, that I wanna share with you, which I haven't shared before, have come through in the past couple of days. Um, this is a new image of what's called the Pillars of Creation, which is part of a nebula called Messier 16. Um, and it's a very beautiful image, I believe. Of um, There were previous images of from Hubble that made it look like a, a hand in space. It, it looks something like that, like a big hand stretching forth. Um, it's a, a lot of, um, it's about two light years across. So uh, from our perspective, it's about 6,000 light years away from us. Um, and it represents an area of the galaxy where new stars are being formed, hence its name, the Pillars of Creation. Um, so basically it is a, a huge cloud of hydrogen and helium um, drifting through space but um, it's in a state of uh, shock, I believe, after colliding with another cloud. And um, as a result, it's undergoing some gravitational collapse and new stars are being formed um, from its cloud. Um, another recent image from James Webb was a star called Wolf Ray at 140. And this is a pair of stars, um, which are too close together to see distinctly. 
what's very interesting about them is there are these rings of dust that have come out of them. They're, they've counted 17 rings in this one image alone. What happens is that every time uh, these two stars come close to each other, they interact and they release a lot of gas um, from mutual collision or something like that. Um, and you can see it as a, as a ring of gas explosions coming out of this planet, uh, this star system uh, very regularly. So this seems to be um, a very, very bright star um, in the process of, of possibly puttering out as it, um, each of these collisions happen. Here are two galaxies. Um, the pair is called VV191. So um, I think it's a very beautiful image because on the right, you can see a very distinct spiral galaxy, um, similar to what our own Milky Way would look like if we could get outside of it, which we cannot do. Um, and on the left is another galaxy, but a little brighter, but a little less, um, little less distinct. And I, I don't know exactly why they're different from each other, but they are interacting with each other because they are quite close to each other. Um, there is an interesting detail if you zoom in on the picture of the galaxy on the left, and it might be a little bit hard to see, but right here where I've highlighted with my cursor, you can see the lensed image of a much more distant galaxy. Um, its image has been distorted by the gravitational lens of the, of the foreground galaxy um, and um, curved on account of that. And besides that, you can see a number of other galaxies. Um, so uh, here is another example of a galaxy, Messier 74. Um, this is another really interesting image um, from the James Webb Telescope. Um, it highlights a lot of colors in the infrared spectrum that we have uh, not been able to see very clearly before. Um, um, and um, as a result, it has a kind of spooky appearance. Here are um, some images of um, the same galaxy. On the right is from the James Webb Telescope. On the left is what it looks like through the Hubble Telescope. It'd be more familiar to us from all these years. Um, and in the middle is a combination of the two. So while the Hubble Telescope sees things through visible light in the visible spectrum, James Webb sees things through infrared light. And so it gives us a very different perspective on what's what makes up um, makes up the structure of galaxies. Um, and then uh, I want to highlight the Tarantula Nebula, another beautiful image recently released by NASA. Um, the Tarantula Nebula uh, is named uh, because through a small telescope, it doesn't look a lot like a spider. Um, and it's not uh, visible from New York, but it is visible uh, from the Southern Hemisphere of Earth um, in a very nearby galaxy called the Large Magellanic Cloud. Um, and this nebula is an amazing uh, place. It is home to a um, very active star forming uh, region, much more active than uh, the star forming regions of our own Milky Way galaxy. Um, and uh, for that reason, there's always a lot of uh, interesting things going on in this nebula. I believe it was in this nebula back in 1987 that we saw the most um, recent nearby supernova. Um, uh, so, uh, by nearby, that's a relative term. Um, this galaxy, the Large Magellanic Cloud, is a, about 100,000 light years from Earth. I don't want to say precisely, but I think it's on that order. Um, it orbits our own galaxy as a sort of suburb or satellite. Um, but uh, that supernova, some of you um, may remember reading about it, or some of you might have seen it if you lived in Australia or the Southern Hemisphere. It was uh, the brightest supernova we've seen in hundreds of years. Um, and the reason it occurred here, as opposed to other places, is that this is a region where stars are constantly being born, and the largest of all stars have a very short lifespan, measured in a mere million years or so, as opposed to uh, most stars, which can last thousands of times longer than that. So uh, I've shown you some things that are very far away. I will show you another thing which is also far away, but much less so. This is the planet Neptune. Um, and here is again through the Hubble, um, sorry, through the James Webb Telescope, a picture of the planet Neptune um, recently taken. And you can see it's, it's beautiful rings. It looks a little ghostly. Um, it's right here, if it's not clear. Um, this is the planet Neptune. The labels around it represent its moons. It has many very small moons and one very giant moon, um, which is so bright, it's kind of overwhelmed the camera here. Um, 
Here are some pictures of Neptune um, from Voyager on the left, the last space probe to ever visit Neptune uh, through Hubble and then through the James Webb. So obviously there's a lot more detail to be seen in the Voyager picture, uh, but since there has not been a space probe to have visited uh, Neptune in uh, many decades, um, the pictures from the James Webb are probably the clearest we'll see for many years to come. Um, I, I hope I've interested you enough to try to see Neptune in the night sky. It's a very interesting little world with a lot of weather and it's very active, a lot like Jupiter. Um, here is a wider shot uh, from the James Webb. Again, you can see Neptune and here's Triton, its moon. But most of the things that you see here are not stars at all. They are distant galaxies. Many many millions of, or even billions of light years away. So it's almost unfathomable how uh, much space there is, how endlessly it goes on. Um, I hope I can uh, maybe someday try to give some explanations in terms of ratios that are a little easier to understand, but um, it's just unbelievable how deep space is and how mostly empty it is. But because there are uh, so many, uh, uh, so many galaxies in every possible direction. Any picture you take of anything um, in space, even if you're trying to shoot a nearby planet like Neptune, you end up with countless thousands of huge galaxies with each of them um, containing billions of stars in them. Um, so that's all I have to share with you today. I am happy to take any questions you folks might have. Thank you so much for being with me. And um, I'll try to see if there's any um, uh, questions in the chat so far. Um, yeah, I see a message from Donna that I definitely want to highlight because on November 10th, we have an amazing speaker, Jill Tarter, who is going to be giving a talk about her work with SETI, among other things, which is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, I, I don't know if um, how many of you have seen the movie Contact, uh, but she was a major inspiration for that film. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you all for um, for listening. So I'm going to um, stop for a moment and just listen for any questions you might have. I'm happy to talk. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you, Jonathan. Does anyone have any questions? You can just take yourself off mute. Yes, hi. I was a little bit late, but I don't know if you talked about meteor showers. Oh, yeah. You know what? I, I forgot to mention a meteor shower that I wanted to mention. Um, there is one coming up um, very soon called the Torrid Meteor Shower. Um, and that actually is going on right now um, as of November uh, 6th. But um, it, it's going to last a couple of days. Um, and there is one day in particular, which is worthwhile to look for, which is the same day as the lunar eclipse. Um, so that's on Tuesday morning, very early. If you get up around four o'clock and you wait until five or so, uh, and while watching this eclipse, the moon will become very dim, which will make it a lot easier to see the meteors that are there. Um, and um, some people have been recommending this meteor shower in particular as a source of very bright meteors. Um, so much brighter than the average meteor. Um, and they're very exciting to see. Um, but meteor showers are not totally predictable. But that is the most interesting meteor shower on the horizon on the horizon um, that, I, that I've heard about. Um, you know, as, as the year goes on, there's always more. Um, in November, we also have the Leonid meteor shower. Um, um, but I think that this month, I would definitely try on Tuesday morning while you're looking at the lunar eclipse to look out for meteors because there's a possibility that could be some bright ones that morning. So thank you for the question. Uh, I also wondered um, mm -hmm. if it's possible to have someone bring a telescope to Vineyard Field. We've had that done in the past. Uh, uh, it was sure. a huge telescope. <laughs> so I don't know how, how well they transport. But, uh, oh, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure uh, which telescope you have in mind, but we, we, we do do things like that. And yeah, if you, if you reach out to us by email, um, you, can, um, you can definitely um, try to set that up. Um, yeah, 
we have would you do like that throughout the winter or do you like to wait till it's warmer um I, I mean personally i've done it at all times of the year um i don't i, I don't have a problem doing it in the winter uh because Great. um uh doing it in the winter is is actually really nice because the winter has some of the best stargazing in my opinion uh, of any time of the year even though it's very cold um because um the the sky is much clearer and there's less light pollution um and there's less haze um which is a big problem in the summertime and less bugs <laughs> so uh, <laughs> the, the downside is um uh, it's very cold but you can you can mitigate that just by dressing warmly and bringing some tea so right uh, if you contact us yeah we can we can discuss that thank you thank you um one question um from sandeep was where in the sky are meteors uh, I would just say they are anywhere in the sky. Um, they're called the Taurus because if you happen to trace them out, they look like they're coming from the constellation Taurus, which is a, roughly where the lunar eclipse will be happening. Uh, but um, you'll see them anywhere in the sky. Um, and you never know. Meteors are totally unpredictable. Um, they, they just happen. <laughs> and you just have to be lucky to be looking in the right spot at the right time. Um, so I don't, I don't recommend people look in one direction versus another. You, you can see them in any direction. Um, um, there is a question from Lydia, which is, uh, what are you most excited about in astronomy? Um, which is a really uh, hard question to answer. There is so much that is exciting and there's always exciting research. And I, I happen to feel that with um, the James Webb telescope and a lot of other big new telescopes coming along, there's a lot to be discovered in the coming years. But just in terms of what I like as a stargazer, um, I would say that I'm most excited about Mars coming into view in December um, because I, I find it most exciting to look at Mars uh, just because uh, it's challenging. But when you're lucky, you can see a lot of uh, very familiar landscapes on Mars. And if you um, uh, if you study your Martian geography, it's, it's, exciting, to, it's exciting to see those things. It's, Imagine if you were on Mars and you were looking back on Earth and you can see very uh, dimly uh, Asia and Europe and the Americas and Australia. That's kind of what it's like to look at Mars. You can see these, these big uh, familiar regions um, and it's exciting to see because my personal likelihood of, of traveling to Mars is very small, but uh, even still with um, simple instruments, we can all see Mars um, every two years. Um, and uh, another question from Lydia, what is your favorite scope? Um, again, that is, um, uh, well, I can only answer for myself <laughs> because it's a personal question, but yeah, my favorite scope is a type of telescope called the Dobsonian. That's not a particular brand, it's just a, a style of telescope, um, which is a very simple type of telescope, really. Um, it looks kind of like a cannon in the way it moves, um, but it has a, a very large mirror um, and it does not have a, a very complicated setup. Um, so instead of um, spending a lot of money on uh, motors and gizmos and trying to figure out which way to point it and stuff like that, you, you just spend all of the budget that you have on getting the biggest mirror possible, which really um, um, is what makes astronomy exciting, having the, 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 the best view through the best and biggest mirror. Um, is there any other questions? Um, and if it's not, then I'll just thank everyone for coming uh, today. I, I hope you get out and enjoy the rest of the day because we are back on standard time. That um, There's only about an hour and a half of daylight left, um, strangely enough, um, but that means there's a lot of extra nighttime for us. So, well, Pedantically, I should say there is not any extra nighttime. There's the same amount of nighttime as there was yesterday, but um, it'll be coming earlier, so <laughs> it'll, uh, we can go out and, and enjoy it. Thank uh, you so much, William. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you, so you to John as well. Thank you so much, and I definitely appreciate the the, the Long Pond Green Belt Association for hosting this. And I look forward to getting out to the pond and walking around in the forest there again. Sounds great. Okay. All right. Thank enjoy you. your Bye. Sunday. Thank you, everyone. Thank and you. We're having the moonlight hike. Tuesday night. So you're welcome oh, to come cool. in the field. Oh, where is that?
right in Vineyard Field behind the South Park Natural History Museum. Oh, great. I'll make a note of that. Yeah, we would love yeah. for you to come because you can point out everything. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, that would be fantastic. Would that, is that so that's Tuesday evening? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to look at what time. Okay. It is ah, yeah, you want to share that? That's 5 30. 5 30. We meet right at the museum. Mm -hmm. we'll walk, walk sure. the little share trail. that information in the chat. Yeah, and if you just want to let the folks who are doing that maybe know that that morning, so before the before the walk in the early morning, they can see a lunar eclipse. Um, it, it's something that people might just get out of bed a, a little bit for and look out the window and see. Yeah, <laughs> it's because it's, it's, a, it's a rough time, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I, it is exciting to see. And if uh, the weather I, last the last lunar eclipse in the spring uh, should have been a great one, but the weather just was terrible, and I, I didn't get to see it. So um, I'm hoping for clear weather Tuesday morning and definitely yeah. tonight if you're having that walk. You said well. the Tuesday morning is at like 4 a.m., right? Yeah, starting around 4.15 in the morning, going onwards till five in the morning will be a total eclipse. Um, but yeah, and then the sun will rise while it's still happening, so. And everyone's welcome to go to the field. That's, that's. A yep, and oh. so then that, what Day is mentioning is the full frost moon hike. Uh, that's at 5.30 on Tuesday, 5.30 p.m., 5.30 to 6.30. So mm -hmm. leisurely hike through Vineyard Field. And we meet at the SOFO South Fork Natural History Museum parking lot, mm -hmm. which is just uh, 200 yards north of the railroad tracks. And okay. we'll also be there at 4 a.m. looking for the eclipse. <laughs> You're welcome to come to that. Stay all, all day oh, at okay. the Vineyard Field. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, now that I made the connection, we, we've I, in that exact field, we've done a lot of stargazing with the, with the telescope and it's been really great. So I hope that we get to back there at some point. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, okay. thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Take care. Have a great day. Enjoy. Bye.